Hello, and welcome to our channel, MarStream, your public performance broadcast platform. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel. You can also donate to our tip jar and support the arts and artists of MarStream by clicking the link below in the description. Check out our website, themarsh.org, for all upcoming live performances. Now, enjoy the show. I don't know about you, but I grew up with no name for my genitals. I learned the names of every other body part, but my genitals remain nameless. I grew up in the 60s and 70s in conservative Indiana. My parents went to church, so I went to church. My parents believed in God, so I believed in God. My parents never talked about sex, so I never talked about sex. As a child and teenager, I learned that boys had penises, but what I had was called down there. We whisper it like it was something we shouldn't talk about. It's, it's different if you have a penis. A lot of boys and men I know, they give their penis a name. One of my boyfriends named his chief, and when he was erect, he would salute him, and he would want me to salute him too. I'm still trying to find a name for my genitals. The correct uh, term is the vagina vulva complex. Of course, that was named by a man uh, who, who named a woman's body. Uh, so anyway, mine has also been called um, beaver, Cupcake, the JJ, flower, pussy, lady garden, coochie, cooter, cunt, poontang, smat snatch, twat. In the spiritual world, it's called yoni. And in my world, my genitals remain nameless. It's just down there. So um, I'm gonna tell you a secret, but we've gotta keep it between us because it's, it's a little embarrassing. I, I had my first orgasm when I was 36, which means I spent half my life faking it. I faked it through uh, numerous boyfriends. I faked it through two marriages. And honestly, I thought I was the only woman in the world who faked orgasms until I saw the movie When Harry Met Sally. So it's, it's 1989 and I'm at the movie with my husband, Butch, and we're sharing popcorn and holding hands and having a really great date night until the famous scene comes on uh, in the diner. And I don't know if you know the scene in the movie, but um, if you don't Google the scene, fake orgasm in diner. So what happens in the scene um, over dinner, Sally, uh, as a way to um, convince Harry that it's possible that a woman has faked an orgasm with him, she fakes an orgasm in this crowded diner. And he didn't think it's possible. He said, I'd absolutely know. And then after she faked this orgasm, he's like, okay, maybe, maybe I didn't know. So as I'm watching this um, with Butch, my hands start to sweat and my face gets red and, and everyone in the theater is laughing. And, and I want to cry because that, that scene's about me and, and I do fake orgasms. It's just easier to fake than to tell the truth. And, and now I'm afraid that my secret is about to be revealed. I, I fake it because I don't feel a thing down there. I, I keep it a secret because who would want to be with me if they knew the truth? I keep it a secret because when my body was under attack, my voice shut down too. So at the movie, everyone is laughing, Butch is laughing, and I'm wanting to turn to him and say, I love you, but I need to tell you the truth. The reason I fake orgasm is not because you're a bad lover. The reason I fake orgasm is sometime between the age of six when I was molested by a neighbor and 30 years later, when I was raped as an adult, my body shut down to feeling any pain 
or pleasure. I, I, I can't feel a thing. But I couldn't tell him, I, I couldn't say it to him. And, and so I stay quiet and we finish the movie, we go home, I just want to go to bed and Butch reaches for me and so we start having sex. And I wait for him until he's almost ready to come. I can tell it's gonna happen. And I open my mouth and I moan, I, I fake it again. But this time I'm wondering, is he gonna notice? I, I uh, you know, especially after the movie, because every time we've made love, I always just wanna say, please slow down, please slow down. Because when we have sex, it feels like I'm being assaulted. My heart feels safe with you, but my body doesn't. It doesn't know the difference between you and the men that assaulted me. So I, I fake it again with him and I am thinking, is he going to you know, figure it out after the movie? And, and he said, Betsy, and I'm like, oh no, here we go. And he says, I love you. And then he put his arms around me and he went to sleep and I know my secret is safe. I'm, I'm sure it doesn't surprise you that after 10 years of marriage and four children, Butch and I got a divorce. I never revealed my secret to him the whole time. And as I'm signing the divorce documents, there's a clause that's been added that says, I'm never to say I was married to you or had four children with you. Oh, it's, it, don't worry, it's just a procedure. Don't worry about it, just sign. So I sign this document, not thinking anything of it, and I literally lose my voice for three weeks after I sign those divorce documents. No voice for three weeks. But really, I lost my voice many years earlier, like 30 years earlier, after I was molested when I was six and didn't tell anyone. I got a sore throat that turned into a strep throat that turned into scarlet fever. I've constantly had sore throats my whole life. And later I was diagnosed with depression. I went to a doctor and he's like, get more exercise. I'm like, I'm working out 20 hours a week. And another doctor said, I'm, you know, take Prozac. And uh, so I take, you know, you've got a chemical imbalance. And I'm, so I take Prozac and it doesn't work. And everyone is telling me what's wrong with me. And I, I'm wondering, is anything right with me? So, I do what any divorced woman over 40 does. I went to the bookstore and bought as many self-help books as possible. And I discovered that one in three women is sexually assaulted in her lifetime more than half before the age of 18. And like me, most stay quiet. I'm, I'm the one in three. And I also discover that about one in three of us could clinically be diagnosed with female sexual dysfunction. I'm the one in three. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm not depressed. Maybe my vagina is depressed from all the times I've been grabbed without my permission. Maybe the label of inorgasmic should be replaced with, we are women who don't feel safe in our bodies. This, this is a big moment for me because for the first time, I don't feel like I'm the problem. I decided to take myself on as a research uh, project. One of the books I bought, it said, you can master anything in 10,000 hours. You could become a great basketball player, um, uh, play the harp. You just have to practice for 10,000 hours. So I'm gonna dedicate 10,000 hours to try to find my orgasm. I didn't know if it was even possible, but I'm willing to at least try and find out. And so I set aside an hour a day for research. At an hour a day, 10,000 hours, it could take up to 40 years. So to start my research, I Google videos on how to have an orgasm. And I do not recommend that you do that because uh, the videos that came up were quite disturbing. It looked like I needed multiple partners, uh, more flexibility, I needed to stretch a lot, vibrating toys, lots and lots of batteries. And the women in the videos are at least 20 years younger than me. Would it even be possible at my age? The next thing I do is read a stack of books. Becoming orgasmic, easy orgasm, instant orgasm, effortless orgasm, extended orgasm, extended massive orgasm. 
tantric orgasm, super orgasm, sexy orgasm, the science of orgasm, and orgasm for one. I read book after book after book. I wanted to find from, out from the experts everything there was about orgasm. And what I discover is when the body experiences trauma like minded, it stores that information. And unless we retrain the body um, to remember that it's safe and we bring the body back into balance with this calm central nervous system, the body continues to be triggered and believe it's in danger. And when that goes on for years, and like in my case, the effects can show up as sore throats, depression, and other diseases. And for me, every time I'm with a man, even if I feel safe with him, my body thinks I'm in danger and it shuts down. So my body's holding trauma, but maybe if I can heal it, maybe it still holds my potential too. Maybe it is possible to have an orgasm. I, I've been a swimmer growing up, so I know that I can train my body. I'm gonna take up orgasm as my sport, but don't tell anybody, because remember, this is our secret. I'm embarrassed about this at my age. So where does one go for a course on orgasm? I'm in Indiana. There is no a local course and go, hi, my name's Betsy. I'm searching for my orgasm that was not gonna work. So I get on a plane to the city where the seeds of the women's liberation movement was planted in the 1960s. New York City. They must have great orgasms there. And more importantly, nobody will know me there. So I sign up for a course on orgasm only to discover there is more than one kind. One uh, course guarantees you'd learn about four different types of orgasm. Another one said 11 different types of orgasm. One course said there were 70 different types of orgasm. What kind did I want? I don't know, I, a good one, a one like the, in the movie when Harry met Sally, but, but real. That's what I want, I want a real one. So while I search for my orgasm in New York at one of these courses, a woman slips me this piece of paper with the name of a man named Bob who she said could help me. She calls him a master stroker. I'm intrigued, so I send him an email. Dear Bob, I, I'd like help finding my orgasm. He writes back, the session will be focused on my clitoris with no internal, internal work, and it costs $550? That's a lot of money for me. I write back, when is your next appointment? I know the session with Bob focuses on my clit and I decide before I meet him, I need to find it. I'd given birth to each of my four children in the hospital. Um, I'd had bikini waxes for, I don't know, at least 20 years, for over 25 years. I've had annual gynecological exams, but I'd never looked at myself. I'd never looked down there. I, I have no idea what I look like, but I'm, I'm finally curious to find out. It's, it's exciting, kind of. It's like meeting someone on a blind date, but this date is with my clitoris. Remember, I'm from Indiana, but I'm doing the research in New York City. So I make a date with myself to look down there. I book a romantic hotel room for the big reveal. And as I check in, the front desk clerk is a guy and he says, any big plans for the night? And, and I'm just like, no, I'm staying in, room service, movie. And he kind of winks at me when he hands me the room key. And I'm thinking, you know, is he reading my mind? Is he, is he wanting, <laughs> does he know what I'm gonna do? So I order room service. I change into a silk robe. I lower the lights. I put on some soft, sexy, sexy music. I'm seducing myself. And while I wait for room service, I take the makeup room, mirror out of the bathroom and I put it on the floor at the end of the bed and, and tilt it up. It's like, I don't know how to do this. So I, I sit at the end of the edge of the bed and I start to get butterflies. I'm, I'm nervous to get to third base with myself. I open my, open my legs. <sighs> 
Why am I scared of myself? Why am I scared of this part of myself? Oh, wait, the outer lips of my vulva are deep burgundy and they, they look like the, um, it's kind of the same color of the curtains in the room. And I reach between my legs and I pull open the outer lips. And inside it's this pretty shade of pale pink that matches my favorite lipstick. I slowly run my finger from the bottom to the top. And I'm surprised my vagina feels like silk. I, I guess I thought after all the rough sex that I'd received, I guess I thought it would feel more like a country road with a lot of potholes. At the top, I feel a bump. My clit. Hey girlfriend, you are not so hard to find. And you're, you're so, so pretty. I, I commit to getting to know my vagina next as a way to get to know my orgasm. I take a course called the Jade Egg Meditation. So this egg, it's carved from real jade. It's a little bit heavy and it's about the size of an egg that you eat for breakfast. Um, the idea is to insert the egg into your vagina as a way to strengthen it and I guess increase feeling. After experiencing abuse, the inside of my vagina is numb. I, I can't feel a thing. I've never felt a thing. So I start by holding the egg on my belly, first to connect with the egg, because that's what the teacher, Jasmine, tells me to do. The egg is hard and cold, and she tells me to meditate with it. And I don't know how to meditate with an egg, only how to scramble one. I, I try my best to refocus my attention <laughs> and I can only think of all the ways I like to eat them. Poached with hollandaise, scrambled with salmon, an egg salad sandwich, deviled eggs, chopped eggs with cream fresh and caviar. And I can go on and on, but Jasmine is speaking. Place the egg just outside your vulva and let your yoni pull it in. Okay, I should tell you, I'm in a room full of 30 women that I don't know, and they are also meditating with their eggs. And I know that sounds weird, but please don't judge. We're fully dressed, except from the waist down, and we're on our own yoga mats. The room is dark, the lights are low, and I have a place in the corner, and I'm, I'm facing away from everybody. So I've got some privacy. It's completely silent except for Jasmine, who I now call the Yoni Whisperer. Keep the egg in the palm of your hand and your Yoni will pull it in. Uh, I'm still holding the egg, nothing is happening. Focus, focus, focus. Nope, still there. I'm gonna concentrate harder. The egg is gone, my, my vagina sucked it in. This is like magic. My vagina is magical. Now bear down to release the egg and catch it in your hand. Oh, oopsies, the egg pops out, misses my hand and shoots across the floor into the corner. It's embarrassing, but I'm also impressed. I just wanna say, ta-da. Keep practicing pulling the egg into your yoni and then releasing it. Your yoni and the egg become one energy. Um, I'm not sure how that's possible, but I'm getting better. I'm pulling the egg in, releasing, pull in, and releasing, in, out. I'm, I'm really impressed with the talent down there. Now we're gonna learn some exercises you can do at home to strengthen your yoni. Imagine your yoni is an elevator and the egg is a passenger and the wall, you're gonna use the walls of your yoni to take the egg to different floors. The lowest floor is closest to the entrance of the vulva and the highest floor is close to the top of your yoni near the cervix. So I practice. I can deliver my egg from the first floor to the second floor, to the third floor, to the top floor. I guess it's the penthouse. 
And then I practice releasing the egg back down to the first floor. Impressive. The idea is to keep the egg inside of you as a way to build connection to your yoni. You can work up to wearing it longer, even for the whole day. After class, I practice with the egg every day for at least an hour. And I start to get fancy. My magical vagina sucks the egg in, and then I can deliver it to the third floor, down to the first, up to the fourth, down to the second, and then back up to the top floor. And that's where I leave it in when I keep it in for the day. It's way up in the penthouse. And at first, I can't feel a thing, but as I get used to it, I start to notice the sensation of the cool, hard surface of the jade egg inside me. Maybe my vagina is healing. If, if I can feel the egg, maybe I'll be able to feel my orgasm someday. I get really good at using the jade egg. I, I, I've worn it around the house. Um, nobody knows, uh, but I've never worn it out in public until one day I'm back in New York City and I decide to leave it in for the day. Um, I'm in New York, I'm meeting a friend for lunch. And so I get dressed, put on my makeup, hold the egg in so it's nice and safe in the penthouse. And I decide to walk to lunch because it's a beautiful spring day and it's about two miles to the restaurant and everybody else is out walking and enjoying the day. Everyone's in great moods. The sidewalk is busy and I'm wearing this long flowy red dress and gold sandals. And for the first time in a long time, I feel really good. I feel hopeful. And I walk about a mile and a half, a half and I'm almost to the restaurant and suddenly, the egg is moving. It, it feels like it's dropped two floors. So I, I squeeze it back up into my vagina, um, uh, pulling my internal muscles up. Okay, everything is good. The egg is back up in the penthouse. I'm good to go. I start walking again and the egg starts moving again. And I stand still and I'm just like, you know, connect to the egg. I'm, I'm remember the magic trick, stay put, squeeze and lift. Squeeze and lift, squeeze and lift. Come on, you can do this. And I start sweating like I'm at the gym lifting weights and everybody is walking around me. Okay, so, okay, I got it back up. Okay, so everyone, everything's under control and I start walking, but my steps get smaller and smaller and smaller and the egg starts rapidly descending like an out of control elevator. And I look down and I lay an egg on Fifth Avenue. After that, I'm hesitant to wear the egg again, and I decide to refocus my research on my clitoris. It's time for my ses session with Bob, remember the master stroker? On the morning of my session, I, I wake up in my hotel room in New York, and I'm excited. This is gonna be a great day. Um, Today's the day that Bob is going to give me my orgasm. I've waited so long for this. At this point, after so many years of not feeling anything, $550 actually feels like a pretty good deal. It's, it's weird, isn't it? Though, though I've, I've, I've never met Bob and it's almost like a blind date. I bought a new dress uh, for the session to meet him. I'm like, what do you wear uh, to meet somebody who has promised to give you an orgasm? I got a green dress because I look really good in dream, green. And normally um, I would you know, wear just like flat sandals because it's you walk a lot in New York. But for today, I'm gonna wear a pair of uh, leopard print heels. So my hotel is on the east side of the city and I walk across Central Park to the west side to Bob's apartment and I'm on the secret mission to find my orgasm. So I knock at the door and as the door opens, there is Bob and he's wearing um, a Navy shirt and Navy pants. It's kind of like what a police officer or a firefighter would work, uh, would wear to work out on their day off. And my first thought is he looks a little bit underdressed for such a special occasion. He shakes my hand and then I meet Anne. She's a little older than me and Bob explains that Anne is there to assist him who is assisting me in finding my orgasm. 
Anne is wearing a robe and they ask me to change into a robe too. Uh, does this seem like an unexpected three-way to you? Because it's already feeling a little weird to me. So I, I walk to the bathroom to change and I act like I'm cool with everything. I like this, I'm a child of the 60s vibe and I'm, this is normal for me. But the minute I close the bathroom door, I, I start to panic. I, I don't think I can do this. I slowly remove my clothes and I catch a glimpse of myself in the mirror and and what I see is a damaged girl from Indiana. I am not a sensual being. This is not a good idea. I'm afraid I might do more damage. I, I don't think I can go through with this. So I, I put on the robe and I reach for the door handle to tell them I've changed my mind. And I open the door and Bob and Anne are already in bed. Bob is sitting upright, he's fully clothed and he's waving at me to join them. And Anne is lying next to him, completely naked. Her robe has been tossed in the chair next to the bed. Her legs are butterflied open. I've never seen another woman's genitals. And now Anne's down there is staring me down. I forget about telling them that I'm leaving and I walk towards Anne and I sit down in bed next to her. I'm slightly mesmerized by what is between her legs. Betsy, look at how her outer lips are swelling as more blood flows to the area. It's a deep red. It means she's getting excited. We have, I haven't even touched her and she's already uh, becoming orgasmic. Now I'm going to move the hood so you can see her clit. Do you see it? All my life, I had heard how hard it is for men to find the clit, and just like my reveal date in the hotel room, I'm surprised to see it really isn't hard to find if you take time to know the anatomy. And from all my research, I know that the clit has 8,000 nerve endings. That's twice as many as in the penis. It's like women are wired for pleasure, but nobody tells us that. So Bob is now wearing blue latex gloves. It's all moving very quick. And he opens this jar of lubrication and takes a small bit on the tip of his right index finger. And I'm gonna touch you now, okay? Yes, okay. Betsy, I invite you to watch as I focus on the upper left quadrant of the clit that has the most uh, sensation. I, I nod like I know this information when this is completely news to me. I have no idea. So Bob strokes Anne's clit and he's using the lightest of strokes and motion. It, it looks like he's barely touching her. How can she feel anything? This is so different from the hard and fast sex that I was used to. Okay. Now, this has been going on for 10 minutes and Bob is still stroking her light but faster. And Anne is experiencing something far beyond what you see in that scene and where Harry met Sally. This is so good. This is so much better than I expected. Betsy, I'm gonna take her to a peak now. Um, she's having an extended orgasm. I not too sure what he means is the peak the orgasm because it already looks and sounds like she is having one but she's been in this state now for over 20 minutes and i thought orgasms were quick and then over and then you go to sleep but now Anne's cheeks are getting flushed and and her chest is red and her breath deepens and it quickens and so does mine and and she's not moaning, uh, it's more of a deep, a deep, deep sigh. And there's this rush of wetness in, in my vagina. She must be having an orgasm. This is an orgasm. She's having an orgasm. This is so much better than I imagined. This is incredible. This is incredible. Betsy, I'm gonna bring her down now. What? No, this is what I'm paying $550 for. Why would you stop her orgasm? But I don't say any of that. And I watch as Bob stop stroking and he cups his hand around her genitals. And for a few minutes, 
it looks like they're meditating together. It's very peaceful. And when Anne's breath is back to normal, she starts to get up from the bed. Betsy, now it's your turn. Now, at this point, I can leave and feel like I got my money's worth. My head is saying, no way, you can't do this, Betsy, get out of the room. But my body inches across the bed towards Bob and I lay down next to him and my knees are together and my robe is covering me. Okay, Betsy, when you're ready, open your legs. Betsy, open your eyes and look at me. Betsy, it's okay. Is it okay if I touch you now? Betsy, you, I need a, a, a verbal confirmation. You need to use your voice. Yes, uh, yes, it's okay. And, and how do you want to be touched? Soft, hard, long strokes, slow strokes, circles. I don't know. No one's ever asked me. I've spent years shielding my body from boys and then men who wanted to claim it, who wanted to take something from me without my permission. How do I want to be touched? I have no idea. Just don't hurt me or force me or surprise me. I don't say any of this to Bob. Uh, can you go slow and soft like you did with Anne? Bob's finger takes a long, slow stroke and my vagina quivers like the wings of hummingbirds are flapping inside. Betsy, you're already having contractions. You're very orgasmic. What? I've spent 25 years thinking I couldn't feel my orgasm and suddenly somebody is telling me that is not the truth about my body. I went to doctors who told me everything that was wrong with me. Nobody ever asked if I'd been abused. I, I guess we don't wanna talk about those things. I was always told that, that I was the problem. The fluttering in my vagina continues, but so does a pain, a cramp, and it hurts. It feels good and not so good at the same time. And I can remember all the times, all the years that I closed my eyes to block out the boys and then men who harassed and molested me and I didn't say no. None of it was rape to me because rape is when somebody holds a knife or a gun to you and you're threatened. And then one night when I was almost 40, I, I woke up in the middle of the night and with a man trying to force himself inside me. It's, it's dark in the room. I recognize his voice as a man I'd met at the party. We're all sharing a big house for the weekend, birthday celebration of a mutual friend. I have my own room and I went to bed earlier than everybody else. I don't know how long I've been asleep. What's he doing in here? And I can't breathe. This man's knees are on my shoulders and he's holding me down as he tries to force himself into my mouth. He's choking me. <sighs> he, he rolls off me and I squeeze my legs together so tight until he digs and knees, uh, digs and knees between my legs and he forces them open. I've been here before, I, I know what to do. I close my eyes and I count to 10. I can handle anything for 10 seconds. One, two, three, four. Please stop, you're hurting me. But nothing comes, no sound comes out of my mouth. Five, six, seven. Is, is this rape? It, it feels like I'm leaving my body. Eight, nine, 10. Why can't I scream? Who's stolen my voice? I'm, I'm hearing Bob again and I remember I'm, I'm safe. I'm, I'm safe. I'm back in the hotel room in New York City. 
Betsy, do you want to go longer? I, I can bring you to a peak. Your body is very responsive. Uh, I look at Bob and I see this small tear in his shirt and I look at Ann who I just met an hour ago and, and I appreciate they're trying to help me, but I say, no, I, I'm good, I, I'm done, thank you. And I get up and I put on my clothes and I walk back across to my hotel room and I decide to continue my research, but I wanna do it on my own. I don't want a, a man or a course or a vibrator or a book or a therapist or a teacher to give me my orgasm. I wanna be the expert on my body. I wanna trust my body to guide me. If it's possible, I want to be the one to give myself an orgasm. And it, it didn't take 10,000 hours and I did find my orgasm. <sighs> Trauma had changed the biology of my body and then I did the work and changed it back. I spent five years researching my body and its ability to feel and found that nothing is or ever was wrong with me. My body was just protecting myself from a world that thinks it's okay to grab my pussy. I, I wrote a book about my secrets and my healing. It's called Autobiography of an Orgasm. One reviewer called the book part erotic and part uh, refreshingly sincere, a roadmap for the orgasmically challenged. Orgasmically challenged, I can't believe the, the um, it was in the UK Sunday Times. I'm like, now it's everywhere, you know, related to my name, orgasmically challenged. It's not a life goal to be labeled orgasmically challenged. I want to remind you, we aren't women who are, are orgasmically challenged. We are women who don't feel safe expressing ourselves. We are women who don't feel safe expressing ourselves. Orgasm is simply the body's natural way to express itself, to express feeling good. And, and using our voice is the soul's way to express itself. And I wanna live in a world where my daughter and your daughters feel safe doing both. Before I released the book, I contacted a few of the men that I had been with and wrote about in the book, but I protected their privacy, changed their names. And um, I just wanted to let them know. I'd never told the story to anyone. And, and one boyfriend gave me permission to use his name and, and write about him. And another uh, boyfriend surprised, uh, told me, uh, threatened to sue me actually. And I said, I was actually surprised because here I'm finally telling the truth about what happened to me in my healing. And all he could hear was that he didn't give me an orgasm. When Autobiography of an Orgasm was released in 2014, my mother was not thrilled. Remember, we don't talk about these things about down there. She actually refused to read it. Uh, at the time I was 51 and she was 81. And I'm finally revealing this lifetime of secrets and she does not want to hear them. We actually don't speak for several months. Most girls who experience sexual assault before the age of 18 don't speak up. They're being afraid of being a judge or getting in trouble. Or when you have the memories later in life, like me, you wonder if it's even true. Maybe I'd made it up. Maybe it was just some fantasy. It wasn't until two years after the book was released that my mom started reading my book because her book club chose to read it. My mom loves the women in her book club, um, so she didn't have a choice. The women were in their 70s, 70s and 80s and they left all the copies of the book at my mom's house. I guess they didn't want to have a book with a big O on the cover around their own homes. And the book club would gather at her house and they'd read a chapter you know, each week together and then discuss it. And at one of the book club readings, when they read the chapter about me being molested in my childhood bedroom, when I was six, my mom said, that couldn't have happened. There is no way that could have happened. And they stopped and every woman in the book club went around the circle and one by one and shared their own secrets. Some of them had, had never shared it with anybody 60 and 70 years. And mom heard stories of other women saying, me too, me too. 
So the morning after book club, I was visiting my mom and I'm in her kitchen doing the dishes and uh, from the book club and, and mom is a master knitter, but she had this ball of yarn and it was all tangled and she's sitting at the table trying to untangle it, but it's just getting more and more tangled. And I'm watching her pulling at the yarn. And then I hear her say quietly, I remember that day. I'm like, what? I remember that day. What day, mom? I, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, that day, the, the one you write about in the book, she, she won't look at me. She just keeps focus on the yarn. And I remember that day. I remember them being in the house and you know, you were just uh, only six years old and, and they were a teenager and they weren't friends with your older sisters. And I wondered why they, what they were at the house and, you know, then they left really quick and, and it was over and I didn't think anything about it until weeks later I was in your room and you loved your dolls and I found your dolls, you had stuffed them under your mattress and you would poke their eyes out and cut off their hair and poke their mouth out. And now we would know it is a sign of abuse, but, but we weren't talking about those things back in those days. We weren't talking about those things. Nobody was talking about those things. 50 years, 50 years, and you are just now telling me you remember that day? 50 years, and all the times after led to years of secrets and shame and me not feeling good in my body, 50 years of not feeling safe and at home in my body, my marriage ended, 50 years. But I don't say any of that to her. I look at her and her hands are still trying to untangle the yarn. And I look in her eyes and I see this six-year-old me that was afraid to speak up and tell the truth. The six-year-old me that was afraid to talk about those things. And so I say, mom, thank you for telling me the truth. Thank you. Since then, my mom and I have had many good sex talks. She even calls her book club the sex book club. And she says, you have to have an open mind to be in it. Um, there's, there's one more thing I wanna tell you. It's something unexpected that happened um, that really helped me fully heal, that really helped me feel at peace with the past and at peace with myself and at peace with the possibility of my body. It, it's a dark, dark stormy night and I find myself in a candlelit room. It's, and I'm looking closely at another woman's pussy. This is new for me. Her, her vulva is burgundy. It's beautiful. I, I can't stop looking at it. Why was I ever scared of this part of myself? I'm not too sure what to do next. Uh, so I wait and we just breathe together. With each breath, her vulva begins to open and this sends chills through my spine. I lean in for a closer look and I can see the juiciness of her vagina. These hidden parts of women are really gorgeous. They're really, really sacred. And with a long moan, her, her body shakes and, and the head of a baby emerges. It's, it's a girl, it's, it's my grandchild. I'm, I'm a grandmother. Her mother gives birth at home in a circle of women. And when my granddaughter cries for the first time, it's the sweetest cry. She is born knowing it's okay to make noise. And we let her cry. We let her voice take up space in the room, in her body, and in the world. I, I just always want her to know that her voice matters, her story matters, and it's safe to express yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Betsy. Wow. 
Um, wow. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I was so moved by that ending when you first came to us. It hasn't even been a year since you performed for us at Monday night. And um, I think there's a lot that can be said. Uh, anyone in the audience, whether you're in our Zoom room or our YouTube, uh, watching on YouTube, uh, feel free to throw uh, questions in the chat. Um, you know, there, there's a, you've done a lot. <laughs> you are you are quite an accomplished woman. And but but one thing when when I heard that you will be with us again, I took a look at your website and you've taken autobiography of an orgasm. You you've run with this and you've had not one but is it three autobiographies plural of, of an orgasm yeah and and so you you've you've given voice to to other women um what are, what are those books like and what was that part of the journey like for you well it's interesting the me too movement happened in 2017 mm -hmm. uh autobiography of an orgasm was released in 2014 and um you know there had been other important books that had been out, um, uh, but maybe not as personal as this one. And, um, and what happened is I had so many people, I really did think I was the only one that this, you know, <laughs> this had happened to. And I started getting letter after letter, not just from women, but from men too. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe they're sharing their stories. I can't believe they're telling me this private part of their life. And then I thought, oh yeah, that's just what I did with the book. And their stories were so incredible that I um, decided to put it into a collection of um, an anthology. And so I released the first book in 2015. And then we did another one in 2016 and another one in 2017. And it was men and women and, um, you know, and there was, there was diversity in the stories. Um, and I was, it was interesting to see some of these people who there, many of them, how their lives changed after speaking up. Some of them decided to, um, to share their stories anonymously. And within a year, uh, the people that had shared anonymously said, the next time you print the book, you can use my real name. Wow. Wow. But the, the point is, can we, I know these are hard stories, to, not necessarily hard stories to listen to, but can we be willing to show up for uncomfortable conversations? And can we just be willing to listen? Um, so that's, so if uh, you need to share something or if somebody comes to you, you don't have to fix anything, just be willing to listen. And you don't have to write a book or tell the world, but you might wanna tell just one person. Yeah, and and you've used, you know, you've you've taken your your uh, position here as a writer and as a performer and, and helped give voices. Now, I, I have to read this in the chat here. Um, Madison in the chat is saying, "Wow, thank you for sharing. I read your book, Autobiography of an Orgasm. Your voice telling this story is profound, emotional, and powerful. Thank you for your honesty. It allows me to be more honest with myself." medicine for healing my body, soul, heart, even more. I mean, can't ask for any better uh, than that. Um, One thing I love about the book is um, it's a book that's passed around and, um, and a lot of women pass it on to their husbands or their boyfriends. And it opens, even if they've been married for a long time or together for a long time, they're willing to show up for, um, a new conversation and the book gives them an opening to do that. Now, and then, then you also wrote, uh, I noticed when I went to your website, uh, Beyond O, uh -huh. and I went, okay, where, where did you go with that? Um, could you tell uh, us a little bit about that? Yeah, that, um, I always think about unpublishing that book because it, it's, definitely not as fun as autobiography of an orgasm, um, which is, you know, um, you know, this is about my healing and it's, you know, I, I, it's more fun. Beyondo is actually the consequences of speaking up. I think it would be different now post me too, but I, um, I actually did have, uh, um, consequences for speaking up. And so it's about that, um, that journey and I, uh, and about how my family treated me and, 
people weren't happy, but I will say that if you stick with it, then now everybody's good and, and we're all good and everybody's, um, you know, um, more willing to be vulnerable and willing to show up for those conversations and um, without judgment, just to listen. But it definitely wasn't, it's just not like I, I, I shared my story and then it was like, you know, everybody's like, great. It was completely the opposite, uh, mm -hmm. which I would still encourage you to share your stories. Um, and usually if people are um, so against you sharing their story, your story, they probably have a story. It makes them uncomfortable because they probably have a story that um, an unexpressed story of their, their heart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, it, you know, it's interesting for me to uh, get to hear this, see this piece again and to hear this person who you were at the beginning of this, of this story. Um, but but knowing you also from your other piece chasing temples, and and from having met you last year and and this woman with a voice, um, with a wonderful voice, and now you have this uh, this new uh, this newer work right on, mm -hmm. and and it's a tat it, it it's it's about um, opening up opening up people's voices giving them voice. It, could you tell us about that and kind of what connections you have here uh, so with your work? In 2019, um, I released this book right on. It's a daily writing practice for anyone with a story to tell. So when I was writing Autobiography of an Orgasm, I spent two years writing a book about my life between the U.S. and traveling to Zimbabwe to do humanitarian work. And I thought that was that was the story. And then when I went to writing circles and, and retreats and um, uh, I would hear, uh, oh, then that's an interesting story, but the real story is about your sensual path. And I was like, there is no way I could tell the truth about that. And, um, and then I realized, no, that's the story that I'm resisting telling and I, I need to tell. But what, what the story, so how the, the book evolved was I was doing these 15 minute, if somebody would have told, told me, you know, write about your central path, no way. But um, these are 15 minute writing prompts. Um, there's 365 days of them. And um, so one of the prompts was um, tell about a time you, um, uh, you didn't speak up. And that brought up you know, this whole story of me remembering um, the uh, assault when I was six years old. I, had, I was in my 40s and I had no memory of it. So this is finally, you know, uh, coming up. So these 15 minute writing prompts, it doesn't mean it's gonna bring up, uh, uh, you know, um, challenging stories, but it's, it's a way, if you're trying to tell a story and you don't know where to start, um, just, you know, these prompts, help me write my own story and I use them as like warm up every morning. Um, but many people, I had a friend that did one every day last year during COVID and he's a um, actor in Los Angeles. And uh, he ended up with, you know, close to 300 stories that, you know, he's working into a solo show and a book and other things. So these it's, it's, I want people to, there's a famous book called the artist way, which I love. And it's, you know, mm -hmm write, you know, three, um, write in your uh, journal for three pages and then don't share it, you know, throw it away. And especially as women, I don't want our stories thrown away. And this book really helps you um, start crafting a story from the beginning, middle and end. The other thing about the book is I have so many people come to me and say either, will you write my story? No, but I'll, this will help mm -hmm. you or um, how do I publish? And uh, so this book has great tips on publishing too, which not a lot of people know about. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you, you're, you're right on about how so much of this is about getting past discomfort or getting out of our comfort zones. And I'm talking about the, well, you know, potentially me as a husband or as a father uh, with this kind of thing, um, uh, you know, getting out of our comfort zones into this. 
um, and you, you you tell us about your your background growing up, which doesn't sound a lot different than mine. Um, and then you, then this journey you go on and you you find all these books. YouTube exists. Um, and it sounds like it was all a, an awfully mixed bag. And, and so have we gotten any better at doing this um, as, as a society, do you, do you feel? Um, that's such a good question. And maybe it's not answerable, but, but it, it... In small groups, I think it, it works so well in... Um, uh, you know, in smaller circles, what I normally, you know, pre COVID, I do retreats all over the world and we mm -hmm. gather and we listen to each other's stories. And, um, and it's interesting because so much healing goes on in those circles. So, so it does exist, but it, it is just, it's either finding it or creating it. And I, you know, we're getting better, but we've also, you know, especially for the last, uh, month even but last years have you know witnessed just pain yelling at pain and uh and we have to find a different way and and not enough people are listening so um you know the the first the best thing i did for finding my orgasm was to listen to my body and i had never done that so if we start with our bodies then maybe we'll start listening to each other as well oh <laughs> Very nicely put. That's that's a wonderful thought um, there, and I, I think that's a great way for us to to close out. I'd like to thank you uh, for joining us. Thank you in the audience. Uh, uh, if you if you're not uh, if you'd like to know more about Betsy, I've put a link to her website in the chat, uh, in both here and, and on YouTube. Again, this this show will be uh, available. It'll be archived for further viewing. If you know someone who you'd like to see this, and um, so, so Betsy, thank you. Thank you so much for, for joining us and, and for, for sharing your courage uh, and, and your words and, and, uh, and your wisdom. We, we so appreciate it. Thank you. I thank you everybody for being here. I, I see your um, chats and I appreciate everybody being here and taking the time to listen. Well, um, do stay in touch, Betsy. Um, we'll look more hearing from you. Everyone else, uh, thanks again for being here. And uh, everyone have a great night. Bye. Good night. Thank you. <laughs>